Hello and welcome to the We Need Water podcast. My name is Michael Brent and I'm the Water Resources Manager for Cascade Water Alliance in King County, Washington. Cascade is a municipal water supplier providing drinking water to more than 380,000 residents. I'm glad you're here. Our topic today is Kirkland's Yard Smart Rain Rewards Program, and our guest is Kate Schmidt. Kate is an environmental education and outreach specialist for the City of Kirkland's Stormwater Group. She helps people in Kirkland connect to their local environment, especially how to understand that their actions at home can support water quality in Kirkland's Creeks, Lake Washington, and Puget Sound. Welcome, Kate. Thanks. Great to be here. Uh, We're happy to have you. And I hear your pup there in the background, and that's just fine. I'm a dog lover myself. Uh, So Quiet, Griffin. Yep. Sorry about that. That's okay. He he has a lot of feelings about water quality, too. Well, I appreciate that. I can absolutely respect that. So um, let's talk about Kirkland's Yard Smart Rain Rewards Program. Just a very elemental level. What is it? Yeah, so the Yard Smart program uh, is an opportunity for residents of Kirkland to make some changes in their own landscape that benefit that benefit water quality um, with a little bit of rebate help from the city. So basically, the concern that we're trying to tackle with the program is um, stormwater runoff. So when it rains. Uh, and the water hits our homes and our streets, all of the water that's hitting hard surfaces is not being absorbed into the ground. So if you imagine like a typical forested environment around here um, with all that nice squishy soil under your feet from all the trees, uh, almost all the water is being uh, uh, caught on the tree canopy and evaporated back up or it's sinking into the ground and making its way slowly nice and filtered to the creeks or to the lake or whatever local water body is closest. Uh, We've changed our landscape a lot. We've added a lot of roads. We've added a lot of rooftops. Um, And so the water runs off of those surfaces much more quickly. And different cities around our area have different kinds of systems. But in Kirkland, at least, we've got a separated system where all of the water that goes down the storm drain is going straight to the local creek. Um, or Lake Washington, it's not getting filtered, it's not being slowed down anywhere along the way. And so when we have a big storm, and all that water hits the creek at once, that can cause a number of water quality issues, such as erosion, um, which puts a lot of silt and sediment into the creek. Um, Also, probably not great for people who own property next to the creek. Mm. (laughs) And uh, it can also cause temperature to go up if that water hits the road on a hot day. Um, Temperature within the, within the creeks, the water bodies themselves. Yeah, exactly. So yeah, the rain would would hit the the road, the temperature of the pavement would heat that water up and then it all goes to the Creek at once. And that can be a problem for any, anything that's trying to live in that Creek at a stable environmental condition. Right. Um, So the yard smart program uh, going back to the actual program itself, those that's kind of the background for the goals. Um, but some people, their, their downspouts from their houses actually go into that same storm system. And so we're trying, where possible, to disconnect those downspouts and send the water from the roof, rather than into the storm system, into that person's yard um, and helping them do some landscape changes that will help that water soak into the ground right there on their property mm-hmm. so that it can move slowly to the creek like it used to before we changed our landscape. Um and mitigate some of those problems. I I don't recall the exact numbers. I, I probably used yeah. to remember them, but uh, I, I don't think it takes much of a disturbance in uh, native landscaping and forest canopy to have a pretty dramatic impact on a local stream. I want to say it's a pretty small percentage of development, of uh, cutting down the trees and putting in homes and businesses and streets and hard surfaces. It doesn't take that much to really kind of wreck the system. It does not. Yeah. Um, I've got a little diagram that I show people when I go out on my site visits and it's got two little drawings of where, where the water goes when it hits the ground in our historic forested 
ecosystem versus our modern developed one. And in the historic one, it's less than 1% of water is running off the top surface as as rainwater runoff. Mm -hmm. Um, And in your typical city, it's about 30% of the water traveling that way to the creek. So you can imagine that that's a lot of changes. Right. The other, uh, the other dramatic impact from that is if you look at the flow rates for any sort of a stream, uh, how yeah. tremendously they can vary after a rain event. It's not a small percentage increase. They can definitely not. Sometimes I think probably even an exponential uh, increase. Mm-hmm. It, it, it's yeah. just amazing how dramatically the, the water flow can change. Absolutely. Oh, and I should say, of course, that anything that's making its way to those creeks that's on our streets or on our rooftops is also being carried there. So any leaks from your cars, any tire dust from your tires, any uh, garden chemicals or fertilizers you put on your yard, um, those are all getting washed down to the creek as well during those big events. And I I think that's a misperception for a lot of people. I think a lot of people think that that stormwater, it goes through some sort of a treatment like our, Mm -hmm. our wastewater or sewers do. But in most cases, that's not uh, that's not true. It is, uh, as you say, whatever is is there is going to get collected, washed off, and into the, the nearest creek or lake. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, um, so I, I do these little maps for people when I do my yard smart visits of just their property and the amount of gallons of water that are coming off their house as um, rainwater runoff every year. And that's usually between... Uh, for a typical Kirkland house, it's between uh, 100,000 to 200,000 gallons of water uh, per house every year. So if you right. think about all that water being routed through a wastewater system, that would be a lot of water for them to manage. So, yeah, it yes. doesn't. It just goes to the creek. Um, so, yeah, we're talking millions and millions of gallons. Huge yeah. volumes, huge volumes of, of water. I've been involved in some rainwater harvesting projects over the years. And if I remember, uh, every square foot of a surface area on a roof for every inch of rainfall, I believe that generates something like uh, 0.62 gallons of water, uh, if I remember that correctly. And so you just do the math. You say, well, you know, 38, 40 inches of rain for every square foot. Uh, it doesn't have to be a, a large structure or a large home to generate yeah. uh, an amazing amount of water. Yeah, I just did a little math on the side there and on your typical rooftop surface. So we've got like a little calculation for that. Um, it's 24 gallons a year per square foot. Mm-hmm. So, yeah. Uh, per That's square the whole foot. year. Though, so yeah. yeah, of course. But uh, it's, a, it's a lot. Um, Yeah, so the program is trying to kind of take some of that off the grid, basically. So uh, it's usually not every single downspout in a home can be rerouted to native landscaping or a rain garden, which we'll talk about a little more. Um, But we usually just connect one or two of them and get between uh, 400 to 700 square feet offline, off the grid. And then that is managed on site. And that helps. Every little bit helps, right? Um, so then the, the program offers rebates to help people do that. So we do it on a per square foot basis. We uh, give back $7.50 per square foot that's taken offline. Um, and it's up to $5,000 per home. So it's a pretty chunky okay, rebate. Yeah, yeah that's, uh, that's, that's a generous, uh, generous rebate for sure. Uh, to be clear, it... though, There's, yeah, yeah, to be Sorry, clear, though, um, People shouldn't shouldn't undertake this on their own uh, outside your program. For example, you you don't want people walking away from from our conversation and thinking that it's okay to just randomly uh, disconnect some of their downspouts. I would talk to somebody who understands um, water flow and engineering, whether it's with our program or someone else, because I know not everyone in your um, that listens to your podcast is in Kirkland. And not every city has a program like this, but you do want to make sure you're not sending rainwater from your roof onto your neighbor's property, for example, um, and ca- or causing flooding in your basement or anything right. like that. You really need to take the individual site into account and then um, make sure that whatever landscaping you're doing can really handle the extra water so that there's no problems down the road. So whether it's us or some other expert in rainwater runoff, I would definitely talk to somebody before you just go hack off your downspout. Okay. 
Yeah. <laughs> excellent, uh, excellent point for sure. So um, let's let's talk about when you're when you're out to, when you're at a residence and you're uh, doing your inspection. What kinds of things are you looking for in terms of an appropriate site where you can uh, yeah. redirect the downspout? It's a great question. Um, primarily, we're looking for space. Um, so, well, the first thing I look for when I'm doing a site assessment is where do your downspouts go? A lot of downspouts are already disconnected from the storm system. Um, they've either got a little splash block that sends it a few feet out from the house, um, which is great, or they uh, run underground to a dry well or a French drain or even just kind of out into the yard. Um, so when we find those, I give people a thumbs up and say, good job, your house is already doing what I want it to do. Mm-hmm. Um, but when we do find those downspouts that are connected to the storm system, then I'm looking for a project area of a certain uh, space that can handle the rooftop area. So rain gardens are sized depending on your drainage rate of your soil between 15 to 32% of the roof area going to them. So just to give an example, if you had a downspout where a hundred square feet of your roof went to it, your rain garden would be 15 square feet to 32 square feet basically. Okay. Um, and usually that's not the case, but it's a, it's an easy example. Usually you've got about three to 400 square feet per downspout. Mm-hmm. Um, so you need to make sure you've got enough space and that it's not right at your property line. Cause again, you don't want to send water to your neighbor's yard. If there's a really big storm event and it overflows um, and you're looking for slope cause you don't want to put some a rain garden or other things on a big slope trying to go uphill water doesn't like to flow uphill too well water doesn't like to flow uphill and if all your water's flowing downhill very very fast then a rain garden's not gonna be the right answer for you yeah so slope is a big one in Kirkland because our whole city's on a slope basically so um, some people's individual properties are great some of them are just not really workable so Hmm. we look for that um And just also, I like to talk to people about how they use their yard. You know, do they have the room to do this without taking out some other feature of their yard that they really enjoy? Um, Because it's important that people love these once they're fully installed and want to maintain them as a feature of their yard. And they really are beautiful once they're in. I I think they're lovely, but, you know, just want to really make sure that it's worth it to people. Of course. So I I work... uh quite a bit with irrigation, landscape irrigation, Mm -hmm. lawn sprinklers and that sort of thing. And one of the biggest problems we find in more traditional development in this area, uh, when the developers go in, they, what little native soil is there, they tend to scrape off. Usually they'll they'll sell that. And then the the landscape through the construction process of the home, the landscape gets, uh, (laughs) <laughs> impacted yeah <laughs> dealing with mostly you know often glacial till anyway so it's yeah. a real problem with irrigation because there's not much holding capacity for the the soil um, definitely so people end up having to overwater just because uh, i mean we would like them to water one one time a week very right. deeply and you have a reservoir there for the for the grass and our plants, that's just not possible. Many times the soil won't accommodate that. So um, as part of your program, do you look at the soil profile? Uh, to, to do, Is that part of the, the process of, of determining Definitely. the site? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, so we look at, at the soil be, before we even go out to the house, just to see what, what kind of soil we're dealing with. Um, Because if you're doing any of these projects, you want to make sure that there's going to be a good infiltration rate, and that's the rate that the water sinks into the ground. Um, So, yeah, if you've got basically concrete soil in your backyard, um, a rain garden is not a good choice because the water is just not going to sink in. But most of the time, what happens when I get out there is people say, oh, I have terrible soils. I have clay soils. You're not going to be able to do anything here. And I go, well, let's, let's take a look at that. Um, so we do a little soil probe and it turns out that's not true. Most of the time, most of the Mm. time, like you're saying, they have very compacted soils. Cause if you think about all those heavy equipment machinery coming in to build a house, it really packs the soil down. Then they just roll some sod on top and Mm -hmm. sod 
is technically a sponge, you know, it's technically a permeable surface where the water soaks in, but not very deep at all, a couple inches. And then it's right on top of that hard soil and it's terrible. Um, I'd say about half the people that call me out to their houses are asking me to help replace dead and dying grass that they're just absolutely dumb dealing with, which I think is a great incentive to do something something else, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so one of the things that we do is rain gardens, but the other thing we do is native plants. And in both cases, uh, when those projects go in, the soils are getting tilled up and amended with compost and topped with mulch both of which will really, really, really help how much water is absorbed by those soils when you're watering them um, and how often you have to water later. Sure. And But we found that um, just putting in native plants for places that a rain garden isn't suitable, usually because of a slope issue or a space issue, um, do almost as much work as a rain garden because the native plants have deep roots. They're adapted to our local climate, so they understand that we're going to have these wet, wet winters, right? And then these dry, dry summers. And so in the summer, they want those roots to go nice and deep so they don't die. And so um, even like your humble little sword fern, which isn't a huge tree or a big shrub or anything, it's got roots that go two feet deep Mm. as opposed to grass, which is, you know, two inches. And so you really have to water native plants a lot less and they help the water kind of follow those roots down into the soil. So um yeah, these, these are really great projects for someone who wants to water less in the summer too. And right. uh, But in general, if you think you have terrible soils, you might not. They might just be packed down. Yeah, and you, you might you be might surprised. To, yeah, you might just need to add some compost and mulch and some plants with deeper roots and it'll go a long way. Um, we're, we're, we're kind of in well into the conversation and we're <laughs> talking about rain gardens, but let's mm-hmm. step back for a moment. Can you define yeah. rain gardens for what, what actually... Uh, is a rain garden? What does it do? Yeah, that's a great question. So a rain garden, um, first of all, what I, I like to define them by what they're not, because it sounds like, um, or they, they often look like when people see a picture of them, or when people see them, like they're supposed to be a pond or a water feature that you have to maintain. Uh, that is not what they are. Rain mm-hmm. gardens are a an area of the land that's dug out. Um, people choose depending on the site, whether it's going to pond up to six inches or 12 inches during a rainstorm. So during a rainstorm, um, they will collect water from a certain area, usually an impervious surface like a rooftop or a driveway. And they, they hold it, they're, they're dug out, and then they're planted up with plants at the bottom that like to have wet feet, don't mind having their roots wet for a little while, and then plants on the sides that like a little bit drier conditions and then plants on the very top that can handle not being in water all the time. Um, And when it rains, the water pools there and it kind of collects it all. And the plants there and the soil in the rain garden are designed to help that water sink into the ground. um, Like we were talking about at the beginning, kind of like a typical forested ecosystem would. Yeah. Um, but they dry out in 48 hours, which I think is a really important thing. They're not going to bring mosquitoes to your house. Uh, the mosquito life cycle is 72 hours. Hmm. So they're very carefully constructed to not give you problems like that. Um, but during a rainstorm, it'll look like you have a nice little pond. And during a dry period, it'll look like you have some nice landscaping. I, I think that's also a bit of a, a misperception. Um, sometimes people equate rain gardens with a stormwater retention pond. Yeah. <laughs> and you got to have a shallow pond uh, in your landscape. And that's not what you're talking about, clearly. Yeah, it's more like if you think about a dry creek bed um, that still has plants around it, but there's no water there right now. That's what they'll look like most of the time, but during a big rainstorm or during a period of of rain for a while, it can look like a water feature maybe for a little bit. Um, but typically they just look like landscaping that happens to be dished out a little bit. Got it. Uh, okay. Well, how many, uh, how many projects has Kirkland completed at this point? Oh boy. Um, that's actually a question I don't have an answer to. So I've been working with the city for, um, I can give you kind of an estimate. Um, I've been working with the city for about a year and a half and this program far predates me. Uh, so it started in 2012 
and it's gone through a number of different iterations along the way. They've changed uh, what the program requirements are, uh, targeted different watersheds, that kind of thing. Um, dozens and dozens, I would say, at least. And okay. uh, so that's both rain gardens and um, native landscaping. And the current program requirements are just that you have to live in Kirkland and your downspouts have to be connected to the city storm system or the rest of it would be a way to send water from your driveway or another um, impermeable surface to a rain garden. Mm -hmm. So that's the current ones. And we did uh, just a couple last year. So we've got a pretty good pool of money this year if people are listening and they're interested in following up. What uh, what's the city's goal for rain gardens? How many would they like to see in the next ten years or so? Um, so we would like to put in uh, about ten a year, and so for the next ten years, we'd like to see at least a hundred more projects. But we could do more. I mean, we're um, we're getting flexible on sort of the uh, size of the project that we're going to put in. So that means we might have more money to do even more of that. So it's not so much the number of rain gardens for us as the number of um, gallons of water that we're managing okay. really for the storm system That's overall. Probably more of your metric then is how much uh, water yeah. you're avoiding. Okay. Yeah. From a, from a city pr perspective and like why this is of value to the city, why it's worth it for us to give money to people. Um, obviously we'd love for all of your yards to look beautiful, but that's not our main goal. It's really that management of how much water is entering the, the, the creeks um, and the lake and the storm system overall, because it reduces how often our crews have to go out and clean the things and everything else. Right. Um, yeah. What should a what should a resident expect after completing one of these projects? Uh, what what will they notice? What will be different? Um, well, hopefully they'll notice beautiful landscaping uh, growing year after year in their yard. Um, there's a little bit of maintenance to do, just pruning and things like that, uh, cleaning out the rain garden over time. But really, I think that they'll just notice it'll be like any new landscaping project, you know, like, oh, my, my yard was a way I didn't like. And now it's beautiful and getting even more so every year. Um, they won't really notice the the water from their house getting managed, but the fish in the creek will notice. And they might, I guess, um, they might notice lower water bills, especially if they're replacing grass with native landscaping. Yes. Uh, they might notice that they have to do less work thinking about their yard because native plants are pretty self-sufficient. I have a beautiful red flowering currant, which is my favorite native plant in the back edge of my yard that gets zero water in the summer. And it is absolutely gorgeous every year and I do nothing to it because I'm a lazy gardener. I like things to <laughs> hold their own. So I'm right there lazy with you. These <laughs> projects. Yeah. Um, I, so yeah, I did less, enough. Less but... time and less mental overhead, yep. I think is what they'd notice. That's, that's wonderful. And, and yes, I, I think for most people, once you get away, if, if you did a big transition like you're describing mm -hmm. where you have uh, a lawn and maybe you water that a lot in the summertime, and then which means, of course, you're going to be mowing and trimming and all that. Yeah, um, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. We just make ourselves uh, slaves to to our landscapes, and which is not to say that other forms, rain gardens or other forms of, of landscapes, don't require some input. But uh, you know, I know, and just growing up the way things were when, when I was a kid, you know, mm -hmm. Saturday was <laughs> mostly Lawn about day. taking care of the lawn, <laughs> you know, and it was a, yep. where I lived, that was a lot of work. You had a riding lawnmower, you had a push mower, a weed eater, a blower, and it took many hours to, to keep all of that, um, to keep all of that looking nice. And so these kinds of alternatives that people are turning to now, I think are, are just fantastic. Yeah, I agree. I like to have enough lawn to spread out a picnic blanket on and for my dogs to do their thing on and, yeah. you know, for my kid to, I don't know, do, but it's not, he doesn't need a lot of lawn. He'd rather go play in the bushes anyway, of you course. know, and pretend to be a little gnome in a fort or whatever it is kids do when they're out in the bushes. So yeah. people talk a lot about kids needing lawns. I've heard that a lot lately. And then we, we talk about how much fun we've had watching our kids in the woods, you know, and like yeah. hiding behind trees and snaking around in there. And 
actually, when I send my, my kid in the backyard, he's spending a lot more time in the landscaped parts that have bigger shrubs. Cause you know, I, I agree. I think that's a red herring that we, you know, we often hear about the, the need for lawn and, and yeah, sure. I mean, if you're going to be playing a baseball game or something, obviously right. you need yeah. a clear space, but for totally. kids just playing in the lawn, I, I can still remember when I was a kid playing out on the lawn, that gets old pretty fast, but, uh, you know, in the woods, the, the, the bush and things like that, it's yeah. so much more interesting, so much more wildlife and insect life, and color and yeah. texture and everything. And I should say there are ways to maintain your lawn that are better for the, the uh, creeks um, as well. And if you look up natural lawn care, there's a lot of resources out there for you for those people who love their lawn or for people who want to keep some lawn. Um, but in general, at least at my house, we're trying to reduce the lawn as much as possible and put in more projects like this. Wonderful. Just because it's easier. Ultimately, yeah, very, very yeah. much uh, easier. And uh, I think you have a, a nicer end result as well. A, a more I agree. interesting landscape. And better for the wildlife. I mean, the wildlife doesn't do much. I, I think the only ones that benefit from my lawn are the crows that come tear up the moss and find the little grubs in there. I'm yeah. sure other people have seen that too. Yeah. That's the only wildlife I see really benefiting from the lawn. Every every other songbird, every other pollinator, they're they're all in in the shrubs and the flowers on the edges. So, yeah, if you like, if you're if you're a bird watcher or you like supporting wildlife, definitely lawn is not the way. <laughs> Agreed. So uh, bottom line, how does, a, how does a resident go about learning more about this program or getting involved with this program? Yeah. Um, well, the first way that they would get con- connected with it um, is to go to Kirkland WA, so that's kirklandwa.gov backslash yard smart. And on there, there's a link to uh, schedule an appointment with me. So then when, um, when that appointment gets scheduled, then I come out to the house, I give them a little consultation, we look at the downspouts, we look at the property, we have a chat about their landscaping goals, um, and we see if there is a viable project. And then if there is, I send them a little site report, just kind of detailing everything we talked about and what the options are. Um, And then from that point, uh, they either do the work themselves or they can find a contractor. We do have a list of people who do this work in Kirkland. So uh, it's about 15 to 20 names um, of contractors. We don't recommend anyone in particular, but a lot of people would rather have someone else do the work. So Mm -hmm. it's a good resource. Um, And then they submit a project approval form. We say, yes, this looks good. This isn't going to cause problems for you or for your neighbors, and it will provide some benefit. Then they break ground, get to work. Um, And then at the end, they just send us all their receipts and photos of their project and we come out and take a look and uh, we give them a check for their labor and materials and other project costs. So yeah, it's pretty, it's pretty simple for what it is. I think for the amount of money that Mm -hmm. the rebate is, I think it's a pretty straightforward process. Well, it sounds like a winner to me. Uh, What about someone who's listening or watching who doesn't live within the city of Kirkland? Uh, What would you recommend uh, uh, they do? Yeah, so there's um, a regional program called the uh, Green Stormwater Infrastructure Mini Grants, which are for people that aren't in a program area where they're el- where they're eligible for other programs. Um, so uh, let me quickly find that. That's just a really great program to look into. It's through the Twelve Thousand Rain Gardens project. Okay. Um, so if you go to twelve thousand raingardens.org, you will find information about some rebates. So definitely check those out. Um, because there may still be money for you, even if you're not in Kirkland. Um, and even if there's not money for you, I think it's a great project to undertake. Um, it can do a lot of good, mm-hmm. make your yard more beautiful, save you water. It's just a I would love to see more of these all over the whole county. So excellent. Yeah. And final question, uh, Kate, mm-hmm. what do you most enjoy about your job? Oh my gosh, that's a hard question. Um, I tell people I have the best job in the city because I don't just get to run this program. I am also, I tell people I'm a professional Lorax. And if you're f- 
familiar with that book. He is the Lorax. He speaks for the trees. Um, so I run the, the tree rebate program as well because trees also have a tremendous stormwater benefit. Um, so we give rebates of up to $500 per year for Kirkland folks to plant trees on their landscape. So I just, I get to be kind of the happy giver of plants. Um, so I think that's just, I mean, it's really, it's really hard to be mad at that person, right? Like I just, I just want you to have a nicer yard and to help you do it. Um, but actually my favorite part of my job, uh, we do a lot of outreach events too. And we do a lot of, uh, we, we do some field trips where we connect people with their ecosystem. And I'm a on the ground environmental educator at heart. So any anytime I get to be out with kids or families, uh, helping them understand how cool the things that we're trying to protect are, kind of helping them learn about the creeks and water quality and the animals and plants that live there. That's my favorite part of my Excellent. job for sure. Yeah, that, that's just great. And I would imagine that uh, on Kirkland's uh, social media, they would they would uh, see a lot about these projects so people can follow you and learn more, too. Yeah, um, not the main city account as much, although they do do a good job of highlighting our work sometimes. But if you follow Kirkland Conserves on Instagram or Facebook, that's where you're going to see a lot of updates about these projects and also things about recycling and other things in Kirkland that are trying to make our city a more sustainable place to live. Excellent. Yeah. Well, thank you, Kate. I appreciate your time. Thank you. And I hope you enjoyed this broadcast. If you did, please like and subscribe. Follow us on the socials. You can also find helpful information about Cascades Water Conservation Programs at CascadeWater.org. Have a great day. And remember, we need water.